Hello, everyone. Are you passionate about something, but you don't know if you can turn it into a business? My guest today did just that and will share with you how you can do that too. Welcome to the sixth episode of Face to Face, where it's all about creating the exceptional you through provoking and meaningful discussions to mind shifting ideas, all with the aim of having you to progress in your career, thrive in your lifestyle, and get the quality of life you deserve. I'm your host, Margaret Williams. Today, we are very fortunate to be joined by Ms. Erin Shields. From her passion of sewing, she noticed the gap in the sewing patterns market. While she liked most of the patterns, the designs of other pattern designers, she didn't find them quite uh, functional for everyday wear and flattering her post baby bod. Erin uh, filled that gap in the market by starting her own company of designing and producing her own private line of sewing patterns that made a splash in the sewing community. Most of those new patterns sell out within three weeks of launch. Erin mm -hmm. began sharing her business experience on her blog. The overwhelming response birthed a separate brand, Launch, Grow, Sell where she offered content and business development classes to help other crafty uh, creators and makers transition their creative talents into profitable businesses through education via courses, eBooks, and business coaching packages. Welcome to the show, Erin. We're glad to have you here today. Thank you, Margaret. I'm very, very happy to be here. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule. Now, Erin, one of the things you shared with me before, before the show was that you started your sewing business back when you were pregnant. Can you take us through the journey as to what got you started and how you turned this into a business? Wow. So I picked up sewing when I was pregnant because, you know, like some women get sick their first trimester of pregnancy, I got tired. So I pretty much slept my whole first trimester. My daughter stole my energy in the womb and she has not given it back to me yet. And she's almost five. But with that being said, <laughs> I, I did not take care of myself. I did not exercise. I survived on cereal and macaroni and cheese. So with that being said, I got big very fast. In my first trimester, I was already in maternity clothes. I could not fit regular clothes. And I did not like the maternity clothes that were available and they were expensive. And I said, I don't want to pay this much money for, you know, a $70 pair of pants, you know, that I'm not going to wear forever. This is just a season in my life. And I was scrolling on Facebook and I, someone shared something about sewing your own clothes. And I clicked on it and went down a rabbit hole and I haven't climbed out yet. So <laughs> that's when I learned that there was more to sewing than quilting. Because that's all I thought of when I thought about sewing. And I said, well, you know, let me buy a little bit of fabric. Let me get a little cheap sewing machine. I'll make a couple of dresses that, you know, I can get some room in and I'll just set it aside when I have the baby because I'm not going to have time for this. Well, what happened is that I ended up falling in love with sewing. I never really had a hobby as an adult. And this was one that just really helped me stretch my brain. It forced me to turn off my phone, not watch TV and just focus on one thing. And um, I fell in love with it and I began to blog it. And that content 
eventually for, for about, I say about two, a year and a half to maybe two years of just blogging consistently, starting from zero on social media and uh, on Instagram, on YouTube, nothing. I just decided to start those channels and I put out content consistently. And when I finally decided to sell a product about, like I said, about a year and a half to two years later, it was well received by the community. And that's how I got started sewing. Well, that's, that sounds very awesome. Um, so you started blogging. So you had a, a, a passion for writing? Yes. I even blogged um, during our time when we met in Iraq. I was blogging then to keep in touch with uh, my family. So I've always been a writer. I'm, a, I'm an introvert, so I process things internally. And, you know, I like to kind of get them out that way. So that part of it, the content creation came very easily for me. I do still enjoy that part of it. Well, you know, uh, when I met you in Iraq, I, I assumed that you were uh, a, uh, an introvert and you're also a child, so I am as well. So yep. we, really, we instantly connected there. Yep. And, and obviously you're very passionate about blogging and you're very passionate about sewing because the clothes that you're making is very, Nice, very nice clothes, and Thank um, you. and I see that you've expanded your line online as well, and, and come out with a lot of different clothing uh, for a different type of um, women's uh, body shape, and, and that that's, that is completely awesome. And I didn't know that you had that talent until I, I started following your blogs myself on social media, and that's uh, it's, it's amazing. Thank you. And, Yes, yes. So if you're just joining us, we're, we're chatting with Erin Shields as she share her tips and tricks on how to perform, uh, transform your passion into a thriving home-based business. Um, now, one of the things that you shared uh, in your bio, uh, that uh, one of the things that prompted you to start your business, uh, you found a gap in the sewing industry. Um, how, how did you find this gap? And what were some of the things you considered that would help you realize the gap had a uh, business potential for you? So I started with me because I am a part of that market. And I kind of started to see the more I learned how to sew that I had the same challenges. And it had to do with the intended body of the pattern company and my body. <laughs> and so <laughs> there was a gap in, and I didn't find that a lot of those styles were flattering for me, especially, you know, around the midsection and that, you know, that weight did not come off as easily as I thought it would. And I said, well, am I just not going to sew until I get my body back? And I was like, that's not an option because I love to do this. And so, like I said, I started with me. I figured out what was missing for me and what I was struggling with, but I didn't stop there. I looked outside of my preferences and I may not have been conscious of what I was doing at the time, but I looked, I looked outside of, of just me. I read comments. I looked at Facebook groups and I looked at the bodies of the women who were sewing these same patterns. And we all tended to have the same types of struggle. And so I said, that's when I validated that gap, when I looked out into the market. Okay, okay. Now, what would you say that sets you apart from these other people that are uh, doing the same thing, designing their, and designing their own clothes? My teaching style is plain. It gets to the point, And I don't put a lot of fluff into things. It's just how I naturally communicate. Um, that was a compliment that I got from a lot of people that, wow, you went straight to the point. This was a short video. You got it done, you know, and you made this understandable for a beginner. And remember, I was still in that skill set. So these things were fresh to me. And, you know, quick sidebar that I think is very relevant to your audience is that we get caught up in I'm not an expert yet. So I can't share with anybody else. And that's not the case. A strength 
of being still in the pool where your people are is that these things are fresh in your head. And as soon as you learn enough and you learn a better way to present something, share it. People will find you relatable. They'll, when you're helping them, then they're going to follow you. And so it was through my content, my free content that I did that. And I think that's what helped set me apart and helped um, have people receive it so well. I did not recreate the wheel. I did not go and try to create something different. I just built a better wheel for a specific market. And that, in addition, um, looking at your videos, you are authentic. And uh, you, you know, and being real, people can relate to that. Mm-hmm. And like you said, straight to the point. And um, not all this stuff. And um, people can, uh, people's busy schedule now, they really appreciate that getting to the point and uh, relaying the message that uh, people need to hear. And not only you talk the talk, but you walk the walk. And that's so important, okay? Yes. Yes. So So, is it possible uh, to use these steps you've taken uh, to find a good business opportunity? Uh, What what uh, tips can you give people who who say they would like to start a food business or get into photography or something along those lines. Okay. So I have four main steps. They can be applied to any type of business. Look at reviews of businesses that you want to compete with, um, coaches you want to compete with, anything that you want to compete with. You, If you want to be in the conversation with that business, look at what they're doing. Also pull from your own experiences. If you are a coach, if you're a photographer, if, you know, because everybody eats, you know, (laughs) so if you want to be in the food industry, what are your experience as a consumer of these services? Go out and look at reviews to see what other people's experiences are. You will find a common thread. Enhance what they do well, do it better, and fill in the gaps where they fall short. And that is, those are my four steps. Look at reviews, pull from your own experiences, enhance what your competitors do well, and fill in the gaps where they fall short. If I were to talk about, you know, you give the example of a a food business. If there's a type of food that's really popular, that showed longevity in the market, then, but there's just not a lot of them, then there's an access problem. You know, so maybe you want to consider serving this type of food in a mobile food business so that you can create a movement of people and your expenses are probably going to be less, you know, and you can also build a community that way. When people, you know, follow you around the community, hey, we're going to be doing we're going to be set up on this corner in this neighborhood. We're going to be set up over here. That's how you build a tribe instead of just, you know, a brick and mortar. You don't recreate the wheel, just make a better one. You know, you're solving that problem of access and keeping your expenses low, right? So um, if there's a service issue, that's a common issue in, in food service. Then maybe you want to work on creating better systems that enable your servers and your kitchen staff to create a better service system. You know, maybe you want to change or work with a professional to get a better layout for your restaurant so people can maneuver through tables. And it's, you know, it's not sexy. But you're just you're filling in the gaps of what other people are doing. Right. How many times have you sat in a restaurant and a waiter is bumping your chair trying to get to the next table? Something's wrong with that layout and it's affecting service. So look at those types of things. Um, And, you know, just to apply it to my steps, you won't know that until you go and sit in the restaurant, until you read the reviews. So um, another example I think you gave was photography. Access. I use a photographer for um, my sewing blog posts and my husband takes a lot of my pictures as well. But the common problem, no matter who I shoot with, is weather has nothing to do with the photography. But the challenge is that there are photographers who only shoot indoors and those who only shoot outdoors. For me as a consumer, that makes me have to choose between photographers and that affects my aesthetic. So if you are a photographer, I would say 
if it's feasible for you to learn how to shoot indoors and outdoors, and that's your specialty. I can shoot both. You've opened up your market. You've opened up your, you know, your potential for making money. Um, another way that you can do that for photography is to uh, to serve a market that is being underserved, like family and children. Lots of photographers don't like shooting children because they move around a lot. But if you if you focus on that, and if you say I shoot families, I shoot children, young children, I specialize in that. Do you know how many moms? will be ready to throw their wallets and paychecks at you? Me? Because I'm still looking for one. <laughs> I mean, senior citizens to get people who know how to shoot them and give them a youthful look, you know, to capture memories like that. You know, large families. Some photographers shoot portraits, close-up shots of people, and you get them with a 10-person family and they just stand you up against the wall and take the picture, you know. But if you say, I specialize in large groups, then, you know, that's what you can become an expert in. And those, those are some advice. That's some advice there. It's the same thing. Find a gap. Fill the gap. Yeah, these are some of the things that sets you apart from your competition. And, and the thing that I find in business is that, you know, stepping outside your comfort zone and be willing to try new things. And uh, this is how we learn. And this is how we grow. And through the mistakes that we make, um, we learn valuable lessons that we can uh, can incorporate in our business to, to, and to improve our processes and to increase our bottom line. Absolutely. So uh, you are full time, you are working full time as an auditor for a large firm and running a business. Um, many viewers, uh, and myself included, uh, are currently in the stage as well. I think I can speak for everyone watching that it's not easy to juggle the two together. Mm -hmm. um, can you share with us some of the things that you do to balance your time between them and still have time for your family? So I don't believe in balance. When I try to balance things, meaning be all for everybody equally as well all of the time, it was just too stressful. Okay. It's just, it was not sustainable for me. And so I, instead of balancing, I prioritize. So I prioritize my family through with my marriage, through scheduling date nights. And with our family, we schedule family dates. Those that's something that we recently started to do within um, this year uh, towards the, the end of 2018 and definitely the beginning of 2019, we put it in the calendar and we do not change those plans for anybody. So, you know, if we reschedule them because maybe a group wants to get together, it's still designated as our date night time. So that's how I make sure that, you know, it may seem a little methodical, but it works. And so it's, it keeps our time committed. I know not to make any uh, interviews. I know not to do any work. This is my time to put my phone down, close my computer and focus and be present on my family because I did struggle with that in the beginning. Um, I remember um, a time, this was probably when my daughter was early three. She's almost five now. She was home and she asked me to play with her. And I was on my computer and I said, yeah, baby, I'll play with you. And I said, just give me a second. You know, she's early three, you know, now means now, you know. <laughs> and I think I was probably still working on my computer for about 10 minutes. And then I heard a noise and I went downstairs because I thought she was downstairs with my mom. I went downstairs and I found her sitting in a corner crying. And I said, baby, what's wrong? And she said, you didn't come play with me. And I was upstairs working. And that moment has stuck with me. You know, I felt horrible that I put my work that was not that important over my child, you know, because those moments, they grow up like this. And, yeah. and even if it's even if it's a, 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 an adult, a person, you cannot get time back. The work will always be there. And so that's when I made a decision to prioritize. When I go out to eat with my husband, when I go out to eat with my friends, 
I'm not one of those bloggers that's pulling out my phone to take pictures of my food and things like that. My phone is in my purse. I'm here with you, you know? So that's how I prioritize making time for my family. Um, when I'm in launch mode and I have something, you know, a big project going on, we have to shift priorities. And my husband, I inform him, I keep him informed every day of what's going on so that I'm saying, hey, I'm about to start launch. You know, can you t- kind of take over these duties, things that I would normally do when it comes to the household or the, fam- uh, the our daughter? And to have his support and have an active partner to do these things is paramount. You know, oftentimes I hear people just kind of going full steam ahead, get on board. I'm doing this. This is my business. It's the most important thing to me. But we fail to get the people who are affected on board. That's key. And um, another way that I was able to kind of balance and prioritize all of these obligations is that I delegate. I outsource. It is key. Um, A lot of people are afraid to spend the money. They're afraid to turn over tasks. Um, to people because they feel like they're not that invested in their business as they are, you can help people be invested in you. Just like you built a following of people who are giving you money, you can get people invested in you to help build your vision, help it become their vision as well. You know what I mean? So that's key. Um, I have, I've had my own stumbling blocks with hiring, but I found a person who I have right now on my team who has taken literally 50% of the workload off of my plate. And I'm also hiring for two more roles right now, another, uh, an assistant, and I'm hiring for a seamstress who's going to work in my home studio. And it's, I got to a point of growth slowly planning cash flow, you know, doing the work that I have to do to produce the income so that I can delegate so that I can continue to, to increase. Cause after a while you hit a cap. So, you know, that's how that's how I'm able to manage all of these obligations. <laughs> that is absolutely awesome. And delegating uh, is, is very important. But how do you get people to buy into your vision? Have a mission. When you start for a company, um, a corporate company, when you get hired and you start training, what do they show you? They share with you their mission statement. They have a video from the boss. They have management come in and talk to you and get you hype about the company. When you start, you are so on fire for this company and these opportunities that are available to you, the experience that you're going to get, that should not change when it comes to your own business. And, you know, you, you may think of it as more work to do, but when you hire somebody and they're not invested in helping you build, they're going to underperform. And they're going to abandon you. So invest the time, set them up for success. If you don't know what your mission statement is, then how are you even performing? You have to understand where you want to go and how this person will help both of you get there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, it's it's very important to when you're delegating, then you uh, you have it frees you up and you have more time to do all the other higher level things that you need to do. Yes, absolutely. Because you'll be stuck in production. And for me, you'll be stuck in production activities and you would never get time to market. So you'll have this whole catalog of products and no, no time to tell everybody about it. You have to delegate. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, So aside from your uh, sewing business, you have launched another business Launch, grow, and sell. Can you take a, a tell us a, a little bit about this and what inspired you to go into this second business? Sure. So that was an accident as well. <laughs> um, I just had a particularly bad day. Um, I went through a season of very bad choices. Okay. So here's the context of how Launch, Grow, Sell got started really quickly. In my sewing, Before I started selling patterns, I was sewing pieces that I would make for people. And I I hated that. It took the fun away from it for me. And so I still continue, though, because I thought that's what I was supposed to do. Well, Boutique contacted me to uh, sell my pieces 
through their through their store. And I was so excited. I hadn't even launched my official clothing line yet. And I entered into a contract with this boutique and um, they closed in the middle of my contract. I went to New York. I found fabrics. Like I took time off of my job to position myself to manufacture products to be able to keep up with the demand for this business. Well, they closed and I was stuck with a couple of thousand dollars worth of inventory. Wow. And yeah, it was it was a bad day. And I found out through a customer. They they never told me this was maybe three or four years ago, uh, about three years ago or so. And to this day, I have not heard back from them when I contacted them about it. And um, I found out for, from a customer who knew that I had this arrangement. And um, that left me with a lot of debt and a bruised ego. I was embarrassed. Um, I was confused on how this happened. I read my contract and I had no legal recourse because it was their contract. It protected them in case I breached, not me if they breached. You know, I was so excited and ignorant of this world that I did not have a lawyer go and read this contract. So I have this inventory and these rolls of fabric sitting in my house, um, several thousand dollars invested and lots of lessons learned. And my pattern line was born because I took the designs that would have been the next designs for the clothing line. And I made patterns um, because the finished pieces weren't selling. They weren't selling because the community that I built that I shared with you earlier, they were sewers. They didn't want to buy finished pieces. And so it clicked to me, uh, duh, Aaron, sell them the patterns. And that's what I did. That's how my pattern line was born. So during that time, the early days of that, that transition from clothing line to uh, pattern line, I just had a bad day. I was feeling real bad. And I said, I wrote down the lessons that I learned just on a little piece of paper came home, sat down in front of my camera and hit record and shared those 10 lessons learned. And I put it on YouTube. I said, there's no way people are going to care about this. I've never shared business content here. This has always been about sewing. If no one, you know, if no one watches this in about a week or so, I'm going to take it down. They watched it, Margaret. And they wow. asked a lot of questions and they said, oh my gosh, thank you for sharing this. Uh, I've experienced the same thing. And I was like, Really, you know, and I got to see that my experiences weren't that unique and that there were other people struggling with this. And so I got more questions and more questions on that video. So I made another video and I don't recall what the name of it was at the time, but it, it was more of a lessons learned type of thing. This was maybe a few months later after I'd learned some more lessons. <laughs> and so I started to notice that I was getting the same. Um, questions. And so I had to figure out because I was working and I had a newborn, you know, at the time. And so I had to realize that um, I had I had to figure out a way to systematize, I think that's the right word, a way to get these questions answered. Um, and I figured out, I found out about MailChimp. I think I ran across Marie Forleo just trying to um, trying to Google ways to solve this problem I had. A good problem. And so I found out about MailChimp. I set up a little free e-course and I said, hey, if you want more questions, this is everything that I know in a five day e-course. I put it up for free. I put it under my YouTube videos and I got about fifteen hundred email signups over the course of a couple of months. Wow. What's going on? I don't know anything. Why are people asking me stuff? You know, I'm just sharing these bumps and bruises that I had. I still wasn't making any money. And more questions came and more questions came. And so I had learned more, you know, a few months down the road. So I stepped back. I opened up my word, uh, my pages on my computer and I wrote an ebook. I bought a free, t uh, I bought a template off of um, creativemarket.com, put together an ebook and I put it up for sale. I think it was maybe $40 and it was start to finish on how to start your sewing business. That sold. So I got more questions. I put out more content related to business, just not really with a strategy, just trying to help people and answer questions. And so once I started to get enough content, I decided to separate my business content from the sewing content 
because it was starting to get a little muddled for me. And I was starting to attract people who didn't sew, but who were still makers and creators. And that is how Launch Grow Sale was born.